this child had to ask why. I'm checking in. Not only as a minister and a pastor in these times, not only as someone who hears these things on the news, but as one that has lost more than one family member to gun violence, more than one family member to AIDS, love and care for family that live with addiction and struggle with mental illness is currently incarcerated. I am checking in, bringing my whole self into this space, knowing but not the expert. Having been broken but not destroyed, angry but not hopeless, I'm checking in. I'm bringing my whole self into this space, all of me, as a partner, a parent, and grandparents, as a pastor, as a sister, and a teacher, as someone still learning, as a neighbor, as a citizen of the world, and I do this, this checking in, because as a self-proclaimed radical faith leader, it is, as 20th century Brazilian educator and philosopher Paulo Fieri wrote, and I quote, the more radical the person is, the more fully he or she enters into reality so that knowing it better, he or she can better transform it. This individual is not afraid to confront, to listen, to see the world unveiled. So I am checking in. Because the work of being the church, not just playing church on Sunday, but living as a loving, transformative, agitating presence of Christ in the world, requires that we not be afraid to confront, to listen, to see the world unveiled. In all of its ugliness and contradictions and broken promises and lies, and to ask that my baby asked, why? and to lament, like the psalmist lamented. Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? But to proclaim, yet you are holy. Let us pray. Day is almost night. Don't want to lose this fight. A fool around, much too long. Now I've been last, but I don't want to look back. I know. Pentecost 
in Advent. And as I like to remind church folks during this period, we are living in times that are far, far from ordinary. When children are being separated from their parents and locked in cages or made to disappear, we are far from ordinary times. When cuts are made to social security and seniors are forced to work long past retirement age just to be able to eat and afford life-saving medication, we are far from ordinary times. When the city of Chicago would plan to invest $95 million in the police academy while closing schools and mental health institutions and divesting in jobs and job training, we are far far from ordinary times. When perpetrators of sexual violence are voted into the highest courts while women are shamed and re-traumatized and not believed, made fun of, pushed aside, we are far from ordinary times. When there are more black and brown men in prison than in places of higher learning, my sisters and my brothers, we are far from ordinary times. When families have to work two, sometimes three, low-paying jobs like my daughter to make sure their babies don't go hungry and still have shoes on their feet and the rent paid for, these are far from ordinary times. When white supremacy, alt-right, and the KKK can plan rallies and protests with no impunity, but the state shows up in riot gear for those grieving the murder of loved ones and crying out for justice, they help us. from ordinary times. When the one holding the highest office in the nation spends more time tweeting hate and perpetuating racism and sexism, disrespecting and alienating allies and risking national security, Lord help us. These are not ordinary times. When a people in need of food, water, electrical power, and access to medical attention get paper towels thrown at them and are told that they just we are far, 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 far from ordinary times. I contend that we are living in extraordinary times, and extraordinary times require extraordinary measures. And we as a church that proclaim to serve a still speaking God must respond in new and in extraordinary ways. For our God is not only still speaking, but God yet believes in us. God yet has a vision for us. God sees the possibility for healing and grace. God is still working. God is still moving. God is still willing us to live. And God is still and yet loving us unconditionally and calling us to be, to be the people of God. Because God is still an extraordinary God capable of extraordinary things. The question is, and I love that there's a comma on the front of the bulletin. I did not know that. <laughs> the question is, are we ready to be an extraordinary people, an extraordinary church working and responding in new and extraordinary ways to build God's kingdom here on earth right now? Are we willing to answer or ask the question, what is required? And listen and respond. Not walk away, but stand in it, whether it's hard or different or new, and respond to what God is asking of us. Now, I was asked this morning to share about Puerto Rico. And when I read Psalm 22, my mind's eye saw the people there lamenting and clamoring for justice, demanding, excuse me, to be seen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My heart felt the pain. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to get this water. Amen. My heart felt the pain of abandonment, the stab of betrayal, and the emptiness of promises. Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? You see, the title I gave this sermon is not 
It's a reality. On September 10th of this year, news reporter and activist Deborah Santana wrote, in Puerto Rico post Maria, the real catastrophe is still colonialism and capitalism, modern colonial exploitation, using public debt as an excuse to accelerate privatization of services and resources while increasing public taxes was already underway in Puerto Rico before Hurricane Maria. And to give one example, austerity for the Public Electric Energy Authority had reduced the number of workers and storage of materials. So when Maria struck, most power lines were felled by trees that were not trained for lack of personnel. To save money, the emergency materials had been sold to other countries. So they were not available to replace the down line. It's easy to say, well, they just didn't have their stuff together. Well, they were already a hot mess before Hurricane Maria hit. And some of that is true. They didn't have the infrastructure in place anyway. But just like you know about New Orleans and Katrina, when you disinvest in a community and don't even invest what's needed to prepare people for what you know, you know is a possibility of happening. Not just what might happen, but it's very probable of happening. It really is about not caring about a community being ready and certainly not caring about a people surviving and really, really not caring about a people being able to thrive in their own homes, where they live, where they find themselves. This is one reason why it took almost a year to restore electricity, causing thousands of deaths in the months following the hurricane. Almost 3,000 deaths not directly caused in the midst of the hurricane. Although some did die, my father's first cousin, may he rest in peace, died, died in the hurricane. But close to 3,000 because of the negligence of being supported and cared for by this nation in particular, because they're a territory. Forgetting that those are citizens of this country living on that island, the negligence caused those deaths. Immediately after Maria passed, many Caribbean and Latin American neighbors offered to send equipment and workers, but the U.S. refused. Instead, with the legal waited for months for the U.S. to give contracts to companies, private companies, and send materials from the U.S., which is further away. So neighbors who said no, you can't help. There's this thing called the Jones Act in place. You can't help. It's against the law. Let them suffer. We'll get it to them when we get it to them, basically. Right? Additionally, the colonial government in San Juan put in place and managed a lot. So you know, it's one thing to say there's a lot of corruption in the government. There is, just like there is here. But when you know that the government that's in place is being controlled by the U.S. government, mostly. All it's going to do is bid, do its bidding, you know? So anyway, the colonial government, San Juan, enthusiastically carried out the wishes of the colonial master in Washington, has redoubled, it redoubled its efforts to privatize the Electric Energy Authority. While the debt will remain the public's responsibility, y'all understand that? <laughs> They're privatizing, sort of like a lot that's happening in Chicago, but then the taxes and the debt still come from the people. It doesn't make sense. This scenario is repeated for nearly all public services, including education, water, and transportation. Meanwhile, the U.S. appointed Fiscal Control Board, known as La Junta, received backing by a U.S. judge to cancel the Puerto Rican elected government's budget and impose its own. Privatization, cutting jobs, benefits and pensions, and continuing sales of public property are the agenda of La Junta. La Junta aims to return Puerto Rico to the markets to resume borrowing money. While Puerto Rico services get starvation budget, the Junta's own budget, paid by Puerto Rico by U.S. orders, has risen to $80 million per year. And the rich 
rich continue to get rich from contracts. No austerity for them. Now, if you follow me on Facebook, you'll see the announcement on my cover that says, put the U.S. on trial for crimes against Puerto Rico. There's an international tribunal on U.S. colonial crimes in Puerto Rico happening on October 27th. It's not just a cute picture, it's really happening. The call to action on the Puerto Rican tribunal shares the world has heard of Puerto Rico's crisis as a result of the hurricane, which demonstrated the power of nature and the failure of capitalism to prioritize the most basic of needs, our planet's health and others. But the aftermath of the hurricanes also demonstrated the criminal cruelty with which the U.S. has responded to devastation by speeding up its plans to restructure Puerto Rico. So it's like, you know, they call it the perfect storm. I don't know what's ever so perfect about a storm like this. But this hurricane has allowed those who are coming in to try to take over the island to really get in there and do their deed at a faster pace than they even thought. So while people are still suffering, some folks still don't have electricity. I was just there, some people still don't have roofs. Some people still don't have access to clean water. While all of this is occurring, those who are trying to privatize and take over and really act like vultures and take, take the, the land away from the people are rejoicing at the fact that this happened so they can do this in a more uh, expedient manner. Nearly a year after the hurricanes, Puerto Rico has not made real progress in its recovery. On the contrary, real progress refers to imposing the most terrible austerity policies from privatization of basic services to cost of living increases while reducing benefits, pensions, and workplace security. The Puerto Rican people are being suffocated by neoliberal economic policy combined with a colonial political status that sequesters its sovereignty in Washington. On the one hand, the U.S. does not provide the necessary disaster recovery assistance, while on the other hand, prohibits, again, the entry of solidarity aid from neighboring countries. This is the colonial neoliberal vision of a thoroughly privatized, privatized Puerto Rico. Vision that the current policies regarding reforms of education and other central services contemplate. A country being bought up and resettled by vulture capitalists and other foreign billionaires with the sole purpose of increasing their income free of all restrictions, free of taxes or oversight, who are served, who are served by impoverished, poorly educated, politically repressed youth. Hear this. I hear folks talk about Puerto Rico. Well, they don't pay taxes. Well, they have it easy. Well, they're all on welfare and that kind of stuff, right? But the fact of the matter is that there's an intentional pushing of people out so that those so-called benefits of tax-free corporations and all that, they can come in and experience. So the same ones that kind of provide this negative narrative about Puerto Rico are using that, using that so they can come in and not have the restrictions that they would have here in the United States. With a diminished population since thousands of Boricos have been forced to migrate in order to survive, the vision contemplates a Puerto Rico without Puerto Ricans. Echoing the murdered independence leader, Dr. Pedro Abisupal, this morning, that the U.S. wanted the cage without the bird. Ethnic cleansing and population substitution are recognized internationally as war crimes. Hence, Puerto Rico, La Isla del Encanto, and a people despised. The text we heard said, many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. The Puerto Rico Tribunal Ad Hoc Committee is convening this important war crimes tribunal in order to expose the true nature of the U.S. war against Puerto Rico. This call for action is not made solely for the sake of posterity, but also seeks to strengthen the worldwide struggle for self-determination today. What is happening in Puerto Rico is different only in scale and duration from U.S. Per perpetrated destruction everywhere, or elsewhere, I should say. Verse 11 of the message translation of Psalm 22 says, I need a neighbor. As the psalmist cries out to God, where are you? My holy imagination causes me to hear God responding, I am in you. So the question is, where are you? Where are you? If we are like Jesus, God made flesh, where are we? God's presence in the world, if we are truly God's presence in the world, where are we?
are we? God's hand and feet, where are we in the midst of oppression, exploitation, genocide in Puerto Rico and here? If we, the church, the body of Christ, profess to serve a living God and proclaim that God is still speaking, then we, my friends, are the ones we are waiting for. We are the ones that the world is waiting for. We are the ones that God is calling, that God is equipping, that God is empowering to do justice and love mercy. Now, our lectionary reading stopped at verse 15. But the psalmist eventually moves from lament to praise. Because the psalmist remembered. For God did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. God did not hide God's face from me, but heard when I cried out. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to God. And all the families of the nations shall worship before God. For dominion belongs to God and God rules over the nations. Posterity will serve God. Future generations will be told about the divine and proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn. And the message translation says God did that. Church, God will do exceedingly and abundantly, far more than we can ever imagine. But let us not forget that God is not only for us, but God works through us. What then shall we do? What is required of us in these times? Are we preparing ourselves daily to be extraordinary? Refusing to be safe, stuck in privilege and comfort. Are we willing to risk it all in order to build the beloved community, God's kingdom, here on earth? In his 1973 poem, Puerto Rican Obituary, it's entitled, 1973, it's really, really long. So I didn't read, I did not going to read the whole thing, but you should read it. 1973 was written, and you would think he wrote it yesterday. Pedro Pietri wrote, Here lies Juan. Here lies Miguel. Here lies Milagros. Here lies Olga. Here lies Manuel, who died yesterday, today, and will die again tomorrow. Always broke, always owing, never knowing that they are beautiful, Never knowing that they are beautiful people. Never knowing the geography of their complexion. Puerto Rico is a beautiful place, and Puerto Ricanos are a beautiful race. If only they had turned off the television and tuned into their own imaginations. If only they had used the white supremacy violence for toilet paper purpose that make the Latino souls the only religion of their race. If only they had returned to the definition of the sun after the first mental snowstorm on the summer of their senses. If only they had kept their eyes open at the funeral of their fellow employees who came to this country to make a fortune and were buried without underwear. Juan, Miguel, Milagros, Olga Manuel, who right now be doing their own thing. Where beautiful people sing and dance and work together, where the wind is a stranger to miserable weather conditions, where you do not need a dictionary to communicate with your people. Aquí se habla español all the time. Aquí you salute your flag first. Aquí there are no down so commercials. Aquí everybody smells good. And aquí TV dinners do not have a future. Aquí the men and women admire, desire, and never get tired of each other. Aquí que pasa power is what's happening. Aquí to be called negrito means to be called love. This poet is calling for the beginners to remember who they are. But reading out loud, I realize he's also calling those who are reading to realize that sometimes it's up to us to remind people who they are because they might not 
ever know. The psalmist called those gathered to remember who they are, even in the midst of lament. God is calling us today to remember who we are, created in God's image, beloved by God, powerfully led by the Holy Spirit, called to be Christ-like in the world, loving the world into new life, causing people to know who they are. Forgetting is not an option. We must remember, put back together, make whole that which God has made good. And remember, as verse 10 says, even before my mother bore me, you have been my God. 